Do you have concerns about your personal information being exposed online? Information such as your home address, date of birth, voting preferences, and more readily available with one search. Data Seal is the comprehensive data removal service I trust. I use it. So use the link below to receive 5% off of your Data Seal subscription and protect your family. Okay, welcome back to True Detective Talk. Today we're going to talk about cold cases because that's my forte. <coughs> we're going to talk about some true crime. We're going to talk about my top five. And we're going to do that all within 30 minutes. So prepare yourself. Number one, I left out a a sports movie the other day on my top five so everything gets pushed down from after Rocky Rockies was number one everything else is going to move down a notch which is going to kick the natural down to the number six and off the list I don't know how I forgot but I did the TV or uh, the movie without limits about Steve Prefontaine that's number two that movie inspired me it also did something that just boggles my mind. There's so many things that boggle my mind. Space, you know, how large it is, death, all these things. But Steve Prefontaine and the movie Without Limits was something that inspired me to, to run. And I hated running. I still hate running. I ran, it seems like, my whole life. In the Marine Corps, I was running. Police Academy, I was running, you know. And I don't like it. But after I watched that movie, I ran. Again. That's what inspiration will do for you. And then, after I started this channel, something very odd happened. Steve Prefontaine's sister reached out to me. Now... For somebody who idolized Steve Prefontaine, if you don't know, you go look him up. He was a, a long-distance runner, and he made the Olympic team, finished uh, fourth in the Olympics in, I believe, uh, I don't even know what year it was. I'm going to say 73 Olympics, um, but or 72 probably. Anyway, he died in a car wreck. I'm going to link his video that I did because... There are some questions about it, and I bring up some good points of whether it was just an accident or not. But he inspired me, and his sister reached out to me, and I shared some emails with her. And when you, if you ever get a chance or it ever happens to you where you are contacted by a family member of one of your heroes or somebody that has inspired you, it's humbling. It really is. I mean, having his sister contact me is almost just as good as Steve himself contacting me, which is completely and utterly crazy, right? So, anyhow, I wanted to throw that in there because I completely forgot about the movie Without Limits. Please go check it out. All right, we're going to get into Idaho. Now, I said I was done with Idaho. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't really plan on doing any... Uh, long in-depth videos on it but I will talk about it in this daily form because it's in the news still and what I read was that Koberger had direct messaged through Instagram I believe one of the victims and she didn't respond now it's an unnamed source although it was on the news and it's not coming from a internet forum so I give it a little bit of credence, but again, you know, unless you hear it from, you know, police, I, I, I don't believe it fully, put it that way. But I do give it a little bit of credence and we can talk about it because is that not what I said exactly, you know, three days after these homicides, a week after the homicides, 
I, I stated that he set his sights on one of the victims and she probably snubbed him and he targeted her. I mean, when you, you know, if it'll come out whether this is true or not, but if it is, you know, we could chalk another one up to, uh, you know, being right. It's like we did on uh, Gabby Patino when I said she's going to be found strangled. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And I said that he would find find himself dead by uh, suicide. And, you know, it just the list goes on and on. Carrie Mae Parker, you know, I was right about, uh, and whatever. I'm not here to blow to my own freaking horn. You guys know, you've been here, you watch the show long enough. It's about, when to get things right, you have to, it's not just guessing. They're educated guessing, based on statistics, based on past experience. When you research past cases long enough and you know human nature, you can figure these things out, okay? And, and it's a little bit harder, as I've always said, when you don't see the crime scene, but, you know... It's not that hard to figure out, to be honest with you. For me, anyhow. It's just like uh, sometimes an electrician will look at something and say, oh, that's not hard to figure out. And I'm looking at it like, oh, my goodness. It's the same thing here. I mean, you guys might look at all of this and all the noise and say, man, how, how does he put that stuff together? For me, I, I you know, it just comes together. So is it a talent? Uh, yeah, probably. You have to have a little bit of talent, but there's other things that go into it in order to succeed. You gotta have a passion. You gotta love to be able to figure it out and put pieces together. And you base that off of statistics. You base that off previous crimes, human nature. Take all that together, and guess what? You can pretty much figure out every crime that's ever been committed. Almost. Anyway. If he did do this, it falls in line with, you know, my thought and Bill's thoughts as well. If you go back and listen to his interview that I did with him, uh, that's pretty much what he said as well. The only difference I think being is I said it's possible or probable that it would be through social media. And he said uh, through physical contacts. But you got to figure He's been locked up for 40 years. That's where his mind goes. He's not used to social media. Whereas I'm in it, and I said it would be through social media, not physical contact necessarily. So and we, we were both right on that, I think. It, it, we'll see how it pans out, right? Another thing that I read this morning is that there was a hit and run in front of Koberger's house, his apartment the night that he allegedly went and did this homicide. Now, some people will look at that headline or read it and think, you know, what, what relevance does that have on these murders? So I'm here to answer that question for you. The relevance is they had roadblocks set up. There was fire, there were lights, there were sirens, there was... Uh, police cars all about right outside of view of his window he could stand up and from all accounts he was an insomniac he did all of his things late at night whatever he was doing he could stand up and look out his window and see the police yet he chose to still go and commit these murders now does that tell you anything because it tells me a lot tells me he had it in his mind that he had to do it that night. Now, why? Was it the urge that he just couldn't overcome? No, I don't think that was it. I think it goes back to his intended target. And knowing this was his last chance. That's what I believe. And again, that would go back to, you know what I said a day, three days after these murders occurred, <clears throat> who the target was. Still could be wrong, certainly, but uh, it had to be something so powerful for him to take that chance, right? He's taking a chance by not only 
being rerouted because of a roadblock so you're not taking the direct path to the crime scene and then on your way back you're chancing that those paramedics police officers are still there reconstructing the scene whatever they're doing and you're going to drive past them that is not ballsy to me that is that's borderline stupid and it makes me wonder if he th it, it certainly falls in line with a narcissistic personality that I am smarter than you I just committed a quadruple homicide and I'm gonna drive right past you and there's nothing that you can do about it it's very intriguing something that small plays a big part in trying to figure out why the crime happened he had to go that night it could simply have been, hey, I made my mind up. It has to be this night. And a nuclear explosion is not going to stop me from doing it this night. I put it off long enough. It could be that. Or, like I stated, it could be, hey, Kaylee was the target. She is gone tomorrow. I know this from reading her social media stuff, from stalking her, whatever it is. And now is my last chance. She never responded to my direct messages. I'm zoned in on her. And it's you, you can't make the leap to say, hey, let's, let's assume that the direct messaging stuff is true. Let's just assume it. You can't say, well, it's because she never responded back. You can't say that, but I believe what you can say, what's the reasoning for the direct message to begin with? To me, that's easy. It's a sexual attraction. Therefore, we go back to what I said in the beginning about a sexual, sexual fantasy. When I say go back to the beginning, I'm talking when these murders occurred. So, in his mind, okay, I'm reaching out to her. She is not responding. That may or may make me angry. But in his mind, it could have been already made up what he was going to do, whether she messaged him back or not. I have my target set. My eyes are on you. What we are looking for then is the triggering mechanism. Okay? You want to look at why this happened. Okay? Why is he doing this? Is it a sexual fantasy driven homicide? He has he's locked in. But what is the triggering effect? What makes him go? And through the course of mankind studying this, there are many things. Somebody's mom yelling at them. Seeing somebody, the victim that triggers past events of abuse, uh, reminding them of somebody. A certain date, a certain time, things like that. Something triggers you to put the murder into effect, put the plan in effect. So in this case, uh, could the triggering mechanism have been, she's gone tomorrow, and I know this, so I'm moving. Could be. All right, enough on Idaho. That was... Uh, some stuff that I've seen in the news recently, so I wanted to address it. Cool case spotlight today is going to be Harry Milligan. Uh, I was reached out by a lady and then Harry's brother, Mark. Mark and Harry, um, both United States Marine Corps members. Harry Milligan went missing on June 30th, 1984. In Iowa, has never been seen again. And his brother Mark has made it his mission to find out what happened to his brother. I find that uh, very noteworthy. I've, I, I applaud anybody that does that. Anybody that doesn't give up and wants to find out the truth. 
So, you know, I'm obviously reached out to a lot on working on cases. And I used to, you know, 10 years ago, do pro bono cases. Uh, you know, it was when I wasn't known as much, right? And uh, then at some point in time, I stopped doing pro bono cases for the most part because you just get so many requests and you can't, well, I can't turn down a family member. I just can't. But I treated it much like a business, you know, hey, unfortunately, I can't do pro bono, you know, you, I, I got to have payment. I, I got to, I got to make a living, right? And that's what I've done. However, there are certain times when money doesn't mean anything. And what matters is being a good human being and helping somebody. Well, that happens to be the case in Harry Milligan's disappearance. I thought about it for a day or so and... You know, I said uh, to myself, you have, you have to understand humans. And what I mean by that is how everything is, everything sort of is a, is a selfish act in life. If you're asking for money, if you do a GoFundMe, um, you run a business. Yeah. I mean, I know it's not selfish, but you're, you're asking for money. You're selling a product, you're putting your work into it and you're getting money back. But then when you get the money back, it makes you feel good, right? Cause you can buy something, you can put it in your bank account, whatever you do with it. Pro bono sometimes is the same way because for me, yes, you're helping these people. And you're not charging anybody. But why are you doing it? And it goes to the psychology of people. It's still self selfish in a way because you're doing it because it makes you feel good. Now, see, that's how some people will look at it. Sometimes that's how I look at it. It's a philosophy. I remember taking uh, philosophy classes. I minored in philosophy. So, I mean, I understand that concept of everything that you do, and I think it was Emil Kant maybe that said it, is there's a self-preservation for it. You're doing it because in a way it helps or enhances you. I hope that makes sense. I didn't want to get too deep on you there. I used to love philosophy, still do. Um, I mean, I read a lot of Nietzsche, Immanuel Kant, like I said, um, you know, some Plato, not Plato, Plato. Anyhow, I digress. I told Mark that I would help him find his brother, or at least, uh, uh, you know, I will try what I can do in order to help. That may be nothing, but you're going to get my best effort. Uh, I can. This show is seen by 1.3 million people uh, a month. So I can get that out in front of them and maybe get people talking. I will look at the information that you have and say, and I do this for when I consult, you know, when families or interested parties get a hold of me and they want me to consult on the case, That's this is exactly what I do. Read it, read the reports, do some research, look at things, say, hey, this is what I see. A, B, and C. This is what needs to be done to move this case forward. A, B, and C. You know, that's what I do. It's my occupation. I've been doing it for over two decades. So, my point here is, the reason there's certain reasonings why I would consider pro bono, and one of them, I mean, this guy is a, a brother marine, and I remember watching Full Metal Jacket and Gunnery Sergeant Hartman saying, and this is when I was a teenager, 
saying after he graduated his recruits from Paris Island, he said, from today on, every Marine is your brother. And I believed in that shit. I took it to heart. Now, I've met a few bad Marines. You have them in any vocation. But for the most part, when I see a Marine, uh, I know that what they went through is the same as I went through, and they get my respect right off the bat. Until they ruin it or whatever, they get it. Whereas, i got to be honest, most people don't. they gotta, they got to earn it a little bit. These two being brothers, uh, Mark also being in law enforcement, I'm going to help him, and I'm not charging. Uh, it's just one of those things. It's something that I can do for a fellow Marine, and I'll absolutely do it. So, you will hear more from my consultation slash investigation on Harry Milligan. Getting back to cold cases and why I do this show. Okay, True Detective Talk was something that I came up with after I was on News Nation, remember? And they kind of cut me off short because I wasn't going with their narrative. And I thought, well, why can't I get up every morning for 30 minutes and talk about true crime from a non-biased perspective? So I'm not cut off. I can talk about what I want. And that was the, the beginning and why I decided to do True Detective Talk. It's easy. I can talk true crime. Now it pulls me away from doing cold cases a little bit. And that's my bread and butter. I do love doing them, but they take time. I can't just sit here and, let's say, talk about... Uh, Madeline McCann, because I don't know it. Uh, you have to research it. You have to study it. It takes months to do that for a consultation, for families and law enforcement, whatever, who get a hold of me for that. For these videos, it takes me a couple days. A couple days. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you have life going on, you know, and have to run, you know, your child here and there and cut firewood and do all these other things. It, it takes time. That's why I decided I will not get away from doing those cases because I enjoy them. But I'm not going to be doing them every week, maybe every couple weeks. True Detective Talk is where I can put my, my focus right now. Because it, it's important to be able to just talk about cool cases and true crime. And not have to sit down for three days and research a case and then regurgitate. I know some of you guys love that. And I love it too. And I will continue to do it. It's just not going to be on a every week basis. As these True Detective Talks are going to be. Now this seems to be a hit. Everybody likes it. These are getting, from what I'm told, are getting more views. Believe it or not, these True Detective Talks are getting more views than the last five cold case investigations that I did and put on video. The Mark Heinball, the uh, shooting of the two kids by the guy inside the house, um, Terrence Williams and Felipe Santos. So all those cool cases that have been done recently are not getting as many views as these are. So I still enjoy doing them. The views are not going to dictate what I do, uh, but just so you know. You know, I like to be transparent. You know, I'm a big believer in transparency. So, you're going to get more True Detective Talk. We're on episode 33 right now. 
and you'll get a sprinkling of cold cases. And every Wednesday, you're going to get redemption from death row. You know, so, hey, that's my channel. That's the way it's going right now. Let's do my top five list. Today, we're going to do just a very general top five bands of all time. My favorite bands. Regardless of genre, whether it's country, rock and roll, rap, you'll find no rap on my top five list. You won't find any rap in my top hundred list. The only possibility would be 1980s Run DMC, Raising Hell. That would be about it. Yet, they're further down the list. Certainly than these bands. So this is what I come up with. And all I did really was look at my playlist. If I like them, I have them on my playlist. Creedence Clearwater Revival. Love uh, John Fogarty's voice. Great music. Kid Rock, you guys know about. Led Zeppelin. Uh, Primus snuck their way in there recently. Nazareth. I love Nazareth. Um, it was one of Axl Rose's favorite bands as well. Alice in Change. Change? Alice in Chains from the grunge era, Rage Against Machine, Soundgarden, um, you know, all of great bands, okay? But these are my top five. Ready? Number five, Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin to me is probably the best band of all time. Uh, but it's number five for me as favorites. And it would probably be higher. It's just they've been so played out. Like, when Stairway to Heaven comes on, I change the channel. I just heard it so many times. The same happened yesterday. Sweet Child of Mine came on. I changed the channel. Just overplayed. And it takes away from the great songs and music that it is. Because it's just been so overly played. But Led Zeppelin, I mean, Days of Confused. John Bonham, the best drummer of all time to me. There's not a song that I don't like from Led Zeppelin. One of my favorites is a critical, uh, the critics don't like it, Hot Dog from the In and Outdoor, I believe, is one of their last albums. And I think it was one of their last albums. But I liked it. I, I like it. There's not a song Led Zeppelin does that I don't like. They, they are the kings. But favorites, they're number, my number five. Number four, and it has, it used to be number one for me. But again, things change over years. The way you view life, the you know, certain things. Now, I still like the same music, but number four is The Doors. I still love their music. I still love Jim Morrison. There's something about his lyrics, his poetry, that I like. The music, the organ, and Ray Manzarek was an incredible musician. To be able to play the bass line with one hand and, you know, the organ part with another, it's almost like you have to separate your brain into two halves to be able to do that. Very underrated musicians. Now, Morrison is not the best lyricist or front man. He had his own style, his own way of doing things. Very broody. But the guy intrigues me, and I still love their music to this day. Favorite song is probably, the, it's The End. The End is my favorite song of all time, I think. It'll probably never change. L.A. Woman, Roadhouse Blues, uh, 20th Century Fox. It was a good one off that first record. Maggie McGill off of Morrison Hotel. Uh, all, all great songs, all my favorites. Number three is Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses is about where I like my music. That hard rock level. You know, ACDC, Guns N' Roses. That's, that's my jam right there. So Guns N' Roses, Axl Rose, one of the best front men of all time, my belief. I went and seen them in concert just last year for the first time. And uh, it was great. He can't hit some of those notes that he used to hit. There's no doubt about it. Yet, he's still a great singer. And they're a great band. Appetite for Destruction. I mean, the whole album I can listen to. 
song one to the end and you know it's probably if I had to pick a song that'd be stranded on a desert island with it would probably be appetite for destruction would be right up there it's so easy I love that song Paradise City of course um, Night Train My Michelle Rocket Queen and then you go to uh, the Use Your Illusions you know yesterday's Knocking on Heaven's Door one of my favorite songs Coma just fantastic I wish that they would put out more original stuff but uh you know hey just like I always say this is my channel Guns N' Roses says it's our music and we'll do what we want with it typical Axl Rose and one of the things I love about Axl Rose he's not out in the public anymore he doesn't have to be I dig that about him you know he doesn't he rarely gives interviews rarely does any social media stuff you know he's comfortable in his skin who he is and he doesn't cater to anybody and that attracts me you know the personality attracts me when somebody's like that number two is Metallica started listening to Metallica probably in 10th grade just the ferociousness of their music inspired me I I continue to listen to them. Some of their albums after, uh, and I guess I could say the Black Album were, yeah, you know, but whatever. They're musicians, they're creative, they're trying to find their own niche uh, and expand. You know, they maybe they didn't want to be just grouped in, tra in thrash metal. So, Master of Puppets, that album is to me their best album followed by probably uh no oh, i guess injustice for all maybe ride the lightning for whom the bell tolls is probably my favorite seek and destroy was my uh teenage motto i listen to that song all the time off of their newer stuff uh, i liked uh, the day that never comes from death magnetic I seen Metallica twice in concert. They were my first concert at Lollapalooza with uh, Soundgarden, who I mentioned. Rage Against Machine, that I mentioned. And it was, they blew them out of the water. I mean, Metallica was so good. So good. Then I went and seen them again in probably 2008 time frame in the MGM in Las Vegas with my best friend from high school. Uh, phenomenal concert. They dropped all these black um, bouncy balls from the roof. And everybody's kicking them around. It was it was great. But Master of Puppets is such a great song. Damage Incorporated, uh, phenomenal. For, like I said for whom the bell tolls. Uh, from Kill 'Em All, the Four Horsemen, Whiplash. I mean, I could listen to from Kill 'Em All. To and Justice for All. All those records in between. Well, there's two of them, but I could listen to them constantly. The rest of them, eh, I pick and choose. I just heard one, uh, Lux External, I think they just came out with, I thought was pretty cool. They're getting up there in age. They still sound good, but you know, those first four albums for me can't get better. Can't get better. Um, I didn't mention Pantera in here. Pantera, you know, that's about the heaviest that I'll go, is Pantera. You know, Metallica Pantera. And Pantera was great. They just didn't, for me, have... Metallica's in their own class. My opinion. Number one, you guys know what it is. <clears throat> Shouldn't even have to tell you. Leonard Skinner. And can you believe, and I forgot to do this. this somebody sent me this. Are you kidding me? Linda sent me this tin. I'm going to put up somewhere. She also sent me this. Joan Jett. Look, look how badass she looks. She didn't make my top five here, but she's in my top ten. And she's my number one female artist. Phenomenal. And I digress real quick because somebody had sent me this. True Crime Recliner. Sent me this book, a bunch of cartoon sketches. 
and he made this sketch of me. Does it look like me? I don't know. But you know what? It's pretty damn cool. Somebody took the time out of their day to do that for me. So thank you so much. But back to number one, Leonard Skinner. I started listening to Leonard Skinner probably 10, 15 years ago now. And I just can't get enough of him. I resonate with Ronnie Van Zant, the way he did things. <clears throat> I love the interview with, I think it was Al Copper, who was their production manager for a couple records. And he asked, they were interviewing him and they were asking him about Ronnie. And he said, he was the leader, there's no doubt. And then he said, I feared him. <laughs> for some reason, I just love that. Every song I love that they did. Needle and Spoon, uh, Sweet Home Alabama, of course, Freebird, uh, Saturday Night Special, songs like uh, Four Walls of Rayford, just masterful. Don't Ask Me No Questions. I mean, when I sing that song, when I'm riding somewhere and playing it, it just reminds me of my life. His lyrics are so spot on to me um, give me three steps the smell I mean, they are just phenomenal and I love Ronnie Van Zant. I love him I love that he was barefooted and he sung like that I love that he didn't write anything down in his lyrics he, he could just come up with it and I love that he was a badass Gary Rossington, the guitarist, said one time, he said, yeah, Ronnie Van Zant was different when he started drinking. And he said, I'll give you an example of it. We were doing an interview, and if you have kids, I'm going to tell you, just tune off for 20 seconds for my language. They're doing an interview, and they're drinking whiskey, and they're getting done, and Ronnie's getting drunker and drunker, and they're in a room, and finally... The interview's over, and Ronnie says, no, now I got a question for you, turning it back to the reporter. And he said, yeah, what? He's like, how the fuck are you going to get out of this room? Let me tell you something. That reporter probably shit his pants. Ronnie was a scrapper. I like that. Ronnie took charge. He was the leader. And sometimes in life you need that. You need somebody that's going to stand up and say, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to be here at 7.30 in the morning and practice, okay? If you want to be the best, this is what it takes. That was Ronnie Van Zant. So, there you go. My top five of all time. Number one, Leonard freaking Skinner. That's it for True Detective Talk on this day. I hope you liked the top five. I hope you liked the uh, talk and how True uh, Detective Talk is coming along and, and doing. You guys seem to enjoy it. I appreciate putting out that uh, content because you appreciate listening. So thank you so much. Thank you for the gifts. I am deeply humbled. And I will end it on that. Nains out.